Awesome, and thanks to all of you who are here for sticking in for the last panel of the league meeting. So if I could ask our panelists to come up and join me. Uh, while they're walking up, I'll go ahead and introduce them. Uh, so we have Sarah Noble walking up on stage now from the Science Mission Directorate. We've got Jake Bleacher from the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. We've got Andy Petro from the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Um, and so before we get to your questions, which we're really excited to hear about, uh, I want to give these guys a, a chance to kind of introduce themselves and talk a little bit about how these three mission directorates can work together, uh, you know, from each of their perspectives as we move forward, not just to Artemis III, but uh, as Jen mentioned earlier for this session, we want to also focus on the Artemis missions past Artemis III. So uh, panelists, I'll go ahead and ask you to give us your perspectives. This on? Yeah, it is. Great. <laughs> Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Sarah Noble, I'm with the Science Mission Directorate. I'm also uh, sort of with LDAP. So the Science Mission Directorate, the Planetary Science Mission, um, has always had the moon in it. It's clearly part of the solar system. There is a second part, part that has been broken off, the, the LDAP program uh, office, which sits within SMD, but sort of outside of planetary science. And I'm kind of the link between the two. I sort of split my time between the two. I'm serving functionally as the liaison between planetary and LDAP uh, to make sure that we are coordinating and, and keeping the moon as part of our solar system. And uh, my name is Jacob Bleacher, and I'm, as Kelsey said, at, uh, serving as the chief exploration scientist in advanced exploration systems uh, inside HEO. Uh, so my job is to uh, support Artemis and support um, the hardware being designed by advanced exploration systems and to ensure that as we develop that hardware and develop those architectures, we're not making choices that uh, minimize or um, even eliminate the ability for us to do the kind of science that we want to do uh, at the destinations we're heading towards. So as Artemis is planning to send astronauts back to the lunar surface, my job is to interface with folks like Andy and Sarah and others in their directorates and keep them aware of what we're doing, uh, what we're building, and then try to understand from them what the goals are that we need to be able to address. And so it really is kind of a, a routine interaction, definitely between the three of us on this stage, but a number of other folks as well. And I think um, as we go through this panel discussion, we'll, we'll probably be talking a good bit about that. Okay, um, I'm Andy Petro from the Space Technology Mission Director. Um, one of my roles is in um, coordinating our investments across all of the different programs we have, uh, especially in relation to the lunar and Mars technology. And um, one reason that's challenging is it's a pretty large shopping list. You heard yesterday about the Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative, which is really just one portion of the the technology areas we're involved with. We're also involved in things like solar electric propulsion, which will be part, which will be uh, demonstrated and utilized on the gateway. Um, and then there's the um, landing precision uh, technology that will be part of probably a number of different landers. Um, and uh, beyond that, I think a lot of the technology work we do um, will will be relevant to things that happen after those first few missions. Um, and so it's a lot of it's focused on the sustainability um, kinds of areas. So, um, you know, that's where a lot of our focus is. Okay, great. Thanks, panelists. Uh, and, you know, this is a great opportunity. We have three reps from headquarters up on stage. It's a great opportunity for you guys to ask them any questions and get engaged in discussion. So I encourage you guys to, to ask them any questions you might have after the last couple days. Um, but while you get your questions together, I have a couple for you guys. And um, Jake, you touched on this as well. But I've heard a few questions and comments, you know, over the week from, from the folks, you know, not within headquarters, um, just a, about a sort of a lack of clarity and how your three directorates work together on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So do you guys want to shed a little light on sort of your communications pathways and, and especially for the Artemis program, um, obviously you three working together is, is vital. So can you guys just kind of clarify how you communicate and in, in what avenues you guys work together for Artemis? Um. Well, one, one thing we do is actually the three of us, plus several others, uh, some, some of them here, um, get together every week, talk about um, what's going on. So kind of what I think of as more the working level um, exchange of information, which can often be very helpful. Uh, the, 
the, the other thing uh, is um, at, at the more senior level, there is a federated, what they call federated team. Uh, actually, I think the administrator put a note out about that last week. So that's been actually going on for quite a quite a while, and that that has a a, a a senior leader from each of the mission directors. They meet on a regular basis and um, and provide you know coordination at that level, and then that that sort of flows down to uh, those of us who work in each of those um, to to sort of follow up on on actions that come out of that. I, don't know if, I mean, yeah, I think, I think Anna makes a good point. It's that, that we are talking at our level, but, but those sorts of discussions are actually happening at, at multiple levels at, at headquarters to make sure that everybody is coordinating and that we all know what each other are doing. Things are moving very fast, and so it's really important that we stay in contact. But beyond those sort of regular meetings, we spend a lot of time in each other's offices. <laughs> Yeah, and um, another aspect to it is that I just maybe kind of set the tone for, for where we are right now. Um, unlike my uh, veteran headquarters counterparts here, I was detailed to headquarters last November, uh, and I was intended to focus on Gateway for a few months. Um, shortly after that, the vice president said that we're going to land astronauts on the moon by 2024. And since then, it has just been a, a race. We are we are working at top speed, and um, in that process, it's the meetings that we're having like this. But you know, right now we're in the process of trying to more clearly discuss our actual lines of communication and how we talk to each other. Um, we recognize that none of us should be getting too far down a path without having some conversation with the other directorates because this is definitely a multi-directorate effort. Uh, it's no, none of us are doing this uh, by ourselves. So, um, you know, just kind of understand that environment that we're in right now and, and how, you know, for me, it's actually just kind of the normal, but. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> yeah. It hasn't but, always uh, been like this. The big yeah, <laughs> so, um, so for me coming on board very, fairly recently, I would say that in this environment, I've been very optimistically pleased by how much we actually talk to each other. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's chaotic and it's moving fast, but we're working on it and we are talking to each other. So I, I like that. Great, thanks. And I think we have a question. Yeah, Esther Beltran, I'm from Survey, a deputy from uh, Reveals, and I come from the Life Sciences uh, program. Uh, but I'm uh, involved in planetary science. But I'd like to ask you guys, so you represent headquarters, which is a very important. Uh, now we have this great opportunity to talk to you and find out exactly what's going to happen with the communications. Because what I, what I see with the moon is you have international partners, you have commercial partners, we have different interests in different uh, areas. So for example, just to give you an example is uh, some people are worried about the pristine areas of the moon and some other ones want to do certain types of research. They interfere with each other. Maybe is there, is there a plan or a vision from NASA headquarters to talk at a, at a level that everybody understands each other? Because for example, planetary protection, we've talked about a little bit, it has been discussed a little bit, but there are no planetary protection requirements for the moon. So what is a vision from headquarters so you can talk to these other international partners and the commercial partners and what are your plans? I'm just curious now because that's important to certain sciences that we do. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, um, a deep and uh, um, uh, complex question. So um, what I can say is that uh, we are interacting with our international partners and we are um you know in the prior um panel uh kevin sato was up here uh, talking about from the space life sciences so um at least within um aes you know we're dealing with the human landing system we're dealing with the gateway and we're considering lunar surface systems and through all of that we're interacting with our partners um in stmd and smd um, as those um, as those go through formulation into programs uh, that are being stood up, then we begin to engage more directly. Uh, so from a gateway perspective, that's the most advanced uh, group. We stood that program up earlier this calendar year. And on that front, we're actually now engaging with our international partners um, uh, through a coordination group in which we're trying to understand what are the needs 
from our international partners, including all the partners from a research perspective of the gateway. And that includes not just science and research, but also technology demonstrations. And so we're, we're um, you know, Kevin was talking about, and, and others in the audience about trying to kind of cross pollinate these groups. That's one of the first jobs that this uh, coordination group has is to become aware of what working groups are out there in these different communities and how do we communicate between them and how do we get feedback from them? We're not trying to uh, reinvent any wheels. Uh, you know, we're not trying to uh, direct what we think the research strategy should be. We're going out and we're asking those communities to give that to us. And so, um, you know, as you hear that, that may be something that the, these smaller communities want to start thinking about. Uh, at some point, as these programs are stood up, as Artemis um, moves forward, we're going to probably be reaching out and trying to communicate. And that's what the, the workshop that we mentioned yesterday is kind of a big first step in trying to do that. Um, and, and again, I want to really uh, dwell on this point for another minute here that, you know, we're not trying to, we aren't sitting at headquarters trying to come up with these strategies on our own. We're referring to the documents, the uh, you know, Jerry was just talking about what was on the screen there. You know, we're going to those documents. That's our first place. All the work that you all put in from Constellation on, before Constellation, those are the starting points for this material. We're not, you know, creating it on our own. And this is where the interaction between our directorates is very key, is that that's how we make sure to, as best as we can, we're not missing things and things aren't falling through the cracks. Okay, thanks. And that brings up a really good point um, that I wanted to kind of follow up on a little bit. And that's the, the idea of, you know, getting community involvement. And I think a big first step, you know, for, for the science community is just understanding what's going on at headquarters and what the current thinking is for the Artemis program in general. So do you guys have any suggestions for how the community can really stay up to speed if, if they're not within inside the NASA network and how they can sort of self organize so that when you do solicit that input, they can be ready and, and willing to contribute? Is there any ideas you can you can share with the group about just how to stay up to speed so that we can maximize on opportunities to get involved. Yeah, I, I would hope meetings like this is, is one important way because uh, this is where we're all sort of uh, interacting with the larger community. Uh, so uh, these kinds of forums are, are one of the best ways. And I would emphasize that the, you know, it's not just the one workshop in, in April, but we will, we will be having workshops and, and we invite and hope that you guys will participate. We definitely need you. Clive. Yeah, Clive Neal, Notre Dame. Um, Lunar Listserv is a great conduit to get information out um, and don't see much coming out of headquarters. So consider using that. If you, if you want, a, want quick feedback, you will get it, that's for sure. Uh, just be careful what you ask for is what I would say. <laughs> Um, but uh, but that's that's one way to, to connect to a to to a broad community quickly. Um, we're getting up to close to 900 on there now, um, so it's it's grown a lot and it is, continues to grow. Has grown at this meeting, believe it or not. So, uh, but that that's one conduit you can if you if you need you know a broad community input. I would craft your question carefully, but that's one way to do it. Uh, to two quick follow-ups to the to the lunar uh, L. Um, the first one is uh, the first talk this morning from Mark Robinson was talking about the multidisciplinary um, aspect of that Tempe study. And so one thing we're trying to do is figure out what the lunar L is for all the other communities as well, so that we can figure out how to how to get out there. Second point, um, when I tried to post to the Lunar L about the Appendix H BAA, it told me I'm not privileged enough to do so, so. I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. I do also wanna say that we have been tapping into the league, we've been tapping into the survey teams, we have been you know, coming to some of our civil servants for, for things and that the community has been really fantastic with the responses that you guys have been giving us. And so I really wanna say thank you to those of you who have participated in many of those activities because we really appreciate it. And some of them have been really short turnaround and we've gotten really great responses. So kudos to the community. Yeah, and actually to follow up on that, I, um, you know, ask us to come talk. Um, you know, we're, we're <laughs> we are very busy right now 
but communicating is a really important part to this. And I understand, you know, again, I just started in this role last November and I very much have a clear understanding of how frustrating it can be when you don't understand what's going on and you don't understand the context of decisions that are being made. I very much understand that. Um, so coming out to meetings like these, I hope that you see today and through this week that headquarters put a high priority on making sure that we were freed up to be here. Um, the opportunities like this are the best chance that we have to communicate with you all is to come and talk to you or give a, you know, via WebEx or telecon presentation. Uh, things are changing quickly. You know, we would like to communicate as quickly as we can about what's going on. I mean, I was at IAC last week and I gave a presentation and several of the slides were different than the last time I gave that presentation the prior Thursday. I mean, it's, they're changing that quick sometimes. So, you know, reach out to us um, and, and ask us and we, we, I can't say we'll be able to do everything, but we understand that that communication is critical. Um, and another part, I just, you know, uh, I've said this to several different smaller subgroups in this room, but um, I also want to be very clear. We talked a good bit yesterday from the architecture discussions about the competition um, mode uh, for uh, working with the commercials to provide the hardware that we're, we're developing now. In some cases, you know, with STMD, they're really working on bringing up in at TRL some of the critical elements that we're gonna need, the technologies we'll need. But at the point we are within HEO, where we need a system to land on the moon, and we're now going to the commercials to provide that, a lot of the work we're doing right now is, is working in a competition sensitive mode to drive the requirements that, um, that are going out. So currently we're in a blackout on the Appendix H. Um, prior to that, everything we were doing was competition sensitive. Uh, and in that case, you know, this, operation, this mode of operation um, we see as being very beneficial to enabling us to meet the goals that we've been pre presented with. But one unexpected outcome of that is that for most intents and purposes, we've kind of had to put up some firewalls between internal NASA competition sensitive efforts and the external community. And I understand, I have been directly told by many people in this room that you're highly frustrated by that. And I understand that. Um, and I, I, unfortunately, that's an outcome of the system that we're in at the moment. Uh, so hang in there with us and we're, we're working through this. Um, but what, you know, we, we just, we don't know who's working with what companies and we have to get the, the main drive right now is to get those, those announcements out so that we can get our commercial partners uh, moving on this and, and building that hardware. So, um, I, you know, we want to talk about the positive things of the communication. I just want to go ahead and grab that bull by the horns on the, some of the negative parts of the, the communication because they've been, they have been communicated to me very clearly. So, uh, you know, just I really want to set the context and understand the environment that we're operating in right now, and that that is it. Brad, uh, Brad Jolliffe, Washington University, St. Louis. Um, Jake, actually, what you were just describing may in part answer my question, um, and, and I apologize in advance. I missed some of the talks on Monday where this might have been presented. Is there a detailed critical path um, document or or something that you could share with us? Um, you know, for me, it's a little bit fuzzy in terms of, you know, how, how does how do commercial and international partners uh, participate, and really, what are the deadlines? Um, and I've seen, you know, we we've all seen the broad overview charts, deadlines in 2022, 2024, sort of overarching goals. But is there sort of a detailed critical path? There, there was one for Constellation. I don't know how much it was shared outside of NASA or could be shared, but um, that might be of interest to some of us. Um, so I know that we understand the critical path. I am absolutely certain there probably is documentation on that. Uh, I personally have not been involved in it, um, and I do not know the status of whether or not that can be publicly shared. Um, but I will check into that for you, Brad. Yeah, I would say, and this isn't relevant to the very near term things, but in terms of the long term, we are trying to be more explicit about what we see the technology challenges being and the things where we want to be making uh, the most important investments. And that's something we have begun to try to share more openly so people have a good idea of what they should be aiming at, at least in the longer term. 
And uh, yesterday, another document was mentioned. Ben was talking about the scientific strategy at the moon, which he said they'll work on releasing. So that's at least one document that'll be that's coming right. out. That should be out pretty soon. Great. Yep. Hi, Jeff Rich from Explore. Well, I'd like to ask if there'll be an on-ramp for commercial orbiters and relays. And one reason I ask is that there was an agreement made this summer uh, with the UK to engage their commercial community on relays for communication and positioning, navigation, and timing. And we would expect that you'd want to work with U.S. companies as well. So, um, under the CLIPS contract, we, yeah, do you want do you want to answer that, Chris? Go ahead. <laughs> I would I would much rather have you answer. <laughs> this one on. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. So so we wouldn't have to on ramp just for orbital vendors in CLIPS. The statement of work or the scope of work already defined in the contract allows the vendor pool to deploy in orbital capabilities. We haven't identified a whole lot of mission activities only needing orbital capability yet, though we anticipate we will. Um, if it turns out the vendor pool we have is inadequate to meet those mission needs, we would certainly consider non-ramp for vendors who are more suitable for that kind of capability. But since we haven't identified a need yet, we haven't gone through the process of determining whether or not the, the current vendor pool has enough resources to do it. Uh, but we would certainly be, we certainly had the capability already in clips. We don't necessarily have to do an on ramp to get there. Uh, ben. For far side landings, you don't want communication relay? Oh, we do, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the point. We already have the scope in the contract to allow that the vendor pool to bid on missions of that form once we put something out there for them to bid on. Ben's going to correct everything I said. Yeah, I'm just going to yeah. <laughs> put some context into your statement about the um, statement of intent with the UK Space Agency. We've had many space agencies reach out to us, particularly wanted to work with us with CLIPS. And so what these statements of intent are, they're essentially just an agreement to talk more. And with the particular agencies, they often want highlighted a particular aspect that they are especially interested in. And the UK was interested in... Um, us looking with them at potential com relay. It does not curtail us working with um, US partners on or US commercial with com relay as well. Right now, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. So just to kind of wrap up the community outreach part of this discussion, you know, on behalf of the non headquarters community, you know, I do really commend you guys on on how much effort you've put in. I mean, to your point yesterday, we had an incredible headquarters representation and you guys are here right now taking our questions. So definitely want to say thanks. And uh, I think everyone's just looking for more ways to get involved. So we appreciate all the effort you guys have been making to include the community. Um, but speaking of orbiters, <laughs> um, Noah reminded us yesterday that uh, LRO was initially intended to be, of course, an exploration and science mission, and, and obviously that's been incredibly successful. So is there a hope of a similarly kind of constructed mission in the future that crosses directorates like that, um, or even sort of an LRO next gen? Can you guys comment on that? Well, I will say that we've been in our calls for instrumentation for CLIPS, we have been very clear that we are open to not just planetary science, but any science, and, and not just science, but technology demonstrations, uh, STMD needs, and HEO needs things that address SKGs. And so a lot of our calls have been very cross-directorate, and, and we expect that to continue because we're all in this together. And, and I mean, one example already, I think, is the first element of the gateway uh, includes a major demonstration of, of a technology STMD has been developing for a number of years with the electric propulsion system. So. Um, I expect to see more things like that. Um, the, some of the precision landing that's being incorporated into uh, some of the CLIPS landers and, and uh, the human landing system as well. So. Uh, speaking of Gateway, I want to come back to a last question that came up in the previous panel. So I know things are evolving quickly, um, but can you guys just speak briefly to the role of Gateway in the Artemis program and, and perhaps specifically comment on the role of Gateway in science at the moon? Um, yeah, so uh, the gateway is one of our critical elements in the architecture that is uh, planning to send our astronauts back to the moon. Um, uh, if you think about it, uh, so Marshall talked about this a good bit yesterday, uh, that's basically our command module. And this is the location where the human landing system will aggregate, uh, the Orion will deliver the crew to gateway. The crew can then move for, into the human landing system down to the surface and back to the gateway. Um, with a multi-element landing system, the gateway is a place where we can deliver those elements and offload some of the power needs uh, onto, the, onto the gateway system itself. 
So it becomes a system that kind of helps and preserves and keeps safe our, our other systems that are doing the other jobs for us, like getting the astronauts down to the surface. Uh, the gateway itself will be able to host payloads externally and internally. Uh, so uh, we had a workshop that Ben Bussey organized as well as um, some others in this room today uh, that happened in early 2018 that focused on very broadly what types of science would we like to be conducting from the gateway. And that served as uh, sort of a baseline for us moving forward uh, to where we are now with the gateway program, starting to think about how do we actually assign payloads. Um, now, I also want to draw back to some of the charts that Marshall showed yesterday, as well as John Connolly, uh, thinking about the way this uh, exploration plan is, is staged. Um, so early on, we're focusing um, basically exclusively on how do we support the goal that we were given of landing crew on the surface of the moon by 2024, after which those systems can evolve into uh, more robust or more capable um, uh, opportunities to address the science that uh, the lunar community, but also, as we've talked about in the panels today, all of the communities have for space exploration and space science. So the gateway itself, first of all, will be a critical element in the system that is enabling us to explore the surface of the moon. Uh, it will also be the pass-through where we bring the samples back through and get them onto the Orion. Uh, if you we're here yesterday, uh, Greg Chavers talked a little bit about the return mass to the, to, from the human landing system up to the gateway. Uh, across these systems, the human landing system, uh, lunar surface considerations, the gateway, and then into Orion, we have to you know, plan how to divvy up the mass that wants to be returned. Everyone in this room, I'm sure, wants all of the mass that Orion returns to the surface of the moon or surface of the Earth to be lunar samples. I would like there to be many lunar samples in there. But in the roles that we have, we also have to consider um, opportunities like what Kevin was talking about. Are there samples that we need to bring back uh, that maybe we're at gateway that are helping us understand how to survive on the surface of the moon and in deep space? Uh, so we have to balance all of, all of these aspects to it. And Gateway is, is kind of that central piece that is the location through which we'll do a lot of this work. Um, you know, from the, from the workshop in 2018, uh, the lunar community um, broadly communicated that, you know, we don't really want to put observatories or anything on the Gateway to just stare at the moon, largely because we can't guarantee look directions or durations of uh, look, looking in one direction from the gateway. So we can't you know, say that this would be a great place to look at the moon. But if you think about the gateway as an element in the overall architecture that enables us to do the things we're talking about on the lunar surface, uh, it's a pretty important aspect to it. And that's how it really supports lunar exploration. Yeah, and just uh, before we take Clive's question uh, or comment, uh, just wanted to also uh, recollect Ben's comment from earlier that that could be a great way to engage the rest of the science communities as well. And I know you guys started that with the Gateway Workshop, but that's another way that Helio and Astro and Earth Science can get involved. Clive. I thought a ground rule was you could only talk once at the mic, right? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get that memo. <laughs> oh, what do you got for me, Clive? Bring it. Clive Neal, University of Notre Dame. Um, it's like deja vu hearing you say what you just said. Um, heard that from Mike Griffin and the Constellation team. Uh, so I'm definitely old now. Um, the, and I know you get this, but it's important to maximize the science return. Science will not justify Artemis. That's many other things above that. But it, in the requirements, there needs to be sample return. And thank you so much for getting sample return mass in there for, uh, the, uh, for the Artemis mission. And uh, I don't think people in this room fully understand uh, the, the blood that had to be lettered to, for you to actually get that done. Um, obviously, we would like more. Um, and so, but I, th I think this will grow. And I just, again, I, I said it the other day, but I say it again, thank you for getting that sample return mass in there because if, if it hadn't have been in there, um, we would be missing out on a big opportunity. And another point is that the email that you had on the Lunar Listserv was, was the wrong one. 
it had changed. So you, you now have full posting privileges. So. <laughs> well, I got a few things to post that are done here. <laughs> so Dallas Beanhoff from Cislunar Space Development Company. Uh, don't forget there are other assets going to the gateway, like the logistics, logistics module that can be used for science before, after, and during the transition to the gateway and after they're, they're done with their job, whether it's at the gateway or elsewhere. So keep that in your mind. Yeah, that's a great point. The, uh, the gateway, if we're, we go back to the gateway topic, um, we kind of went through it really quickly yesterday. There's the power propulsion element that Andy was talking about, which really shows a maturation of technology um, through STMD to flight now. Um, but in order to support that 2024 landing, if you saw uh, the, the um, phase one chart that Marshall showed yesterday, or if you could read it in much smaller version from John's side of the chart over there, um, there's, there's the test flights for Orion, but then there's the buildup of the gateway, the Artemis support missions. The power propulsion element will be the first one to go up. Then we'll have a habitation element that goes up because we need to have something that the Orion can dock with, that the landing system can dock with. And then there's a third radial port or a third port that is a radial port that will um, uh, dock with a logistics module. So the Orion itself is not going to be able to carry everything that the crew need for the time that they're at the gateway. So for the crewed missions, we'll have a logistics module. And that logistics module uh, is there for at least the time period the astronauts are, and then it is jettisoned. Um, so I, I really wanna stress um, the difference in these, these phasing of the, of the mission, the overall um, architecture. In the beginning, we're, we've described this almost as we're, we're acting in a tactical sense, trying to get to the point of supporting that first landing. After that, it will likely evolve into a much more strategic approach of how we use the gateway, how we use the elements that are there. For instance, that logistics module is jet currently uh, set to be jettisoned. Um, a few people that are in this room reminded me that at a meeting earlier this year, I referred to myself as the dumpster diver of HEO because I love, <laughs> I love the word jettison because when they jettison something, I, I take it as everyone's done with that. I want to know what I can do with it. Um, so those are, you know, there's flexibility designed into the system to enable us to try to achieve some of the science goals, either as, um, as Amy talked about, the high priority science goals that we're going right after, but there may be opportunities throughout this architecture to address other science goals in ways that you might not think. So a logistics module may be able to go to a different orbit that achieves you to do or enables you to achieve some science that you weren't um, maybe not initially thinking about. So, you know, that's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're considering as much of that as we can. A uh, question over here. Uh, Jonathan Weinberg, Ball Aerospace. At the, the workshop in early 2018, uh, which was actually in Denver, um, we, we had a, a very good turnout, I thought, of uh, science community from all, all the different divisions and talking about uh, science that we could do from the gateway. Uh, but we also started to get into conversations of whether or not there might be extra launch capacity when uh, launching some of the gateway uh, modules and, and building blocks. And I haven't heard a lot of discussion since then on whether that's going to be the case and whether or not um, groups potentially from SMD uh, are uh, looking at uh, these as potential rideshare opportunities for uh, pure science missions, getting a translunar injection. Yeah, so uh, one thing I can say from a, the HEA perspective is, you know, we're, we're trying to at least announce opportunities when we have them. One thing we are doing is building stuff and launching it. Um, we're not necessarily in a position to also uh, fund the types of activities you're talking about, but we may be able to present opportunities for the ride shares or, or an opportunity to fill that. And again, I, I just want to stress the environment we're in right now and how quickly we're moving. And, you know, I don't want to speak for the two of you, but we have heard the message that we need to get that figured out. And um, it's, it, you know, that is a topic that we talk about. Um, but I can't, I can't say anything specific to funding those activities. Sarah, can you, can you comment at all on whether or not things like Simplex or, or some of the uh, astrophysics rideshare opportunities may 
may be able to use some of the gateway launches as potential ride shares? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the goal of Simplex is to find a ride anywhere, anytime, right? And so uh, I think that there will be a lot of things launching towards the moon over the next few years, and I think that's a lot of opportunities. And so I, I see that generally as positive. I mean, the, there's, there'll be clips launches in addition to, right. to HEO launches. So I think we're just going to launch a lot of stuff at the moon, and that provides a lot of extra opportunities. And every time one of those opportunities comes up, we will look to maximize it. Thank you. And, and that would be for uh, technology demos as well. Yeah. Hey, we are quickly running out of time, so Dean, quick, quick question or comment? Yeah, well, it's a quick comment. The first is, if you go back and you look at the Apollo Systems Engineering documents for both the LEM and the Command Service Module, there was no sample return mass. It wasn't even considered except that, yeah, we'll bring stuff back. So we got everything back by system margin that developed as we got more and more comfortable in the system. So the point is not having a very hard multi-hundred kilogram sample return mass requirement doesn't necessarily mean all is gloom and doom. The second thing is, um, and specifically with respect to Gateway, um, a lot of the life sciences research requires bringing back condition samples. And um, we do that on Dragon from Space Station. And right now, Orion doesn't have the capability of bringing back condition samples because it's, it's not the capability. Um, the bright side for sample return is that at some point we're going to need sample return capability from, from Gateway that is not part of Orion, like what we do for Dragon from Space Station. There are some issues with design because coming back from Gateway is about 11 and a half kil kilometers per second to infinity, which is a different thermal protection system, but Dragon might have it. The point simply is there may be more than hundred of, hundreds of kilograms capability coming back from Orion, or excuse me, back from Gateway. Uh, uh, see. Dragon has four metric tons coming back. So the point is at some point we can evolve this to getting lots of stuff back and we don't necessarily have to panic because we don't have it in the first mission. So. And Laura with the last question. Okay, um, Laura Gerber, JPL. I just wanted to comment. I would like to get metric tons of things back because I was thinking that when uh, the scientists will pick what wants to come back, they'll probably say, oh, we want rocks and we want special samples. We'll comb through all of them. We'll pick the most scientifically interesting. And those will be very, very precious. And then you kind of also need a lot of rocks and samples that you can just cut up and give away to people. I think everyone in the room is aware of that. And especially for the ISRU community, just wants to take a jig, giant pile of regolith and try a bunch of stuff <laughs> out on it. I think that's also important to want to bring back. All right. Thanks, Laura. Sam. Yeah, I have a, a question here from uh, Pam Clark, who sent it remotely. And I'm going to paraphrase slightly, basically said, Constellation is canceled. Do we really want to use Constellation era documents as the basis for what we're doing? And uh, I would say, well, the Constellation documents are pretty good. We never actually did that. And the science content of those documents um, uh, was still remains incredibly 100%, 120% relevant. And, you know, we have a very different implementation strategy this time. So I would contend that that's probably just fine but uh, others may uh, disagree. Yeah, so I, I just answered my own question. Constellation wasn't canceled because the science wasn't right. good enough. Yeah, that wasn't the, the, the reason science the Constellation part of was canceled. Constellation canceling. wasn't the problem. There was um, other bigly big problems with Constellation. Uh, okay, so before we conclude, I just wanna you know, highlight a point Sarah just made, which is we have a lot of things flying to the moon coming up. So it's, I think it's a really exciting time and it's a testament to you guys on this stage and the rest of the folks you work with that are making that happen. So I wanna thank you for that and thank you for being here today and please join me in thanking our panelists.